Uh, so whenever we're solving an equation, we want to isolate the variable, get the variable, one variable, one times the variable on one side, and the numbers on the other. So uh, we have one third times the variable minus five. That's something that we can do right now. Add five. Add five. Can I do that? Add five. Could I add six or seven? Twelve? I can't. Well, the point I want to make is that you can. Okay, whether or not you would, that's up to you. So, it's a good idea to add 5 because the negative 5 and the 5 cancel exactly, and we now have the variable and just a coefficient on this side. Okay, one third of a is 6. If one third of a is 6, then we know that a must be 3 times bigger than that. So, what do we do? Multiply by 3, squeeze a 3 in there, multiply by 3, 3 and 1 third cancel each other, multiply by 3, and we get A equals 18. Okay. So now we have variables on both sides. We only want variables on one side. Okay, are we going to move the variables to one side? Not really. Okay. I want you to not think of it so much like that. We're not shifting things around. We are manipulating each side separately and uh, but doing the same thing on both sides. Okay? So how will we cancel out the variables on one side and then at the same time do the same thing to the other side? We'll just say the first thing you did and that's probably the answer to my question. Plus two and two and two and two and two and side. Add two and two and See what I'm saying is, M. what I'm saying is that we're not moving two and over there. I know it's like a popular thing to say, but it's uh, not really mathematical. Uh, we have a, a deficit of two and over here. We have a negative two and over here. And if we add two and we cancel that, that negative out, that deficit out. So it's just gone. Right? We're not moving it anywhere. It's just been eliminated. Okay? Uh, the equivalent of zero is here now. And over here, we also need to add 2n. If this was a scale, we would put 2n over here, and that would be the opposite of negative 2n, and they would just be canceling each other out uh, and, and adding nothing to it, and so the, the right side would be equivalent to just 5. And over here, we also need to keep it balanced and put 2n on this side. Could we, right now, would we dare to do a second step at the same time. What could we do? Yeah. Add seven. Add seven. Okay. Now, that's precisely what I I would do. Not that it's the right thing, and that anything else is the wrong thing. But I see sometimes uh, people add two end to both sides and subtract five from both sides. Subtract five from here. Subtract five from there. Now. When you get done, you'll find out you have zero on one side and everything else on the other side, which is fine. Uh, you just make it extra work. So think about that as you're working this step out. This is 12. 6n is 12. So how do we find out what n is? Over 6. 6. That'll counteract the multiplication by 6. That by 6, n equals 2. <coughs> Um, so there's something that we, we could say, like, in general, when you have variables on both sides, what should you do? Uh, get it so that there's variables only on one side. Yeah, get, get rid of the variables on this side, and then whatever you did to do that, do the same thing on the other side, and it'll all be balanced, but now we'll have variables only on one side. Okay. I didn't get to show this to you guys, so uh, so
Five? That was minus seven? Don't help me all at once. I'll get it. Is that right? 4x minus 7, negative 2x plus 5? Uh, Is that right? If you don't remember, that's okay. Let's just go back. Oh, that's not right. Let's just go back. 4x minus 7, negative 2n plus 5. Negative 2n plus 5. Okay. So there's our equation. Okay. So we have 4 x over here. How do I put a negative 2x over here? Two negative 2x underneath. Put two balloons underneath. Two balloons that are marked x. Okay, and we got minus 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then plus 5. balanced, of course it is. Okay. So the point I'm making here is that we're not moving things from one side to the other side. If we did that, it would actually throw things off. Uh, what we're doing is balancing it out. So uh, on this side, we're going to add two x's. Okay. And on this side, we'll add two x's. And these two x's just cancel these two x's. So we can just get rid of them. So you see what I'm saying? That's, that's the point I made. We're not moving things from one side to the other. We're just canceling them out on one side and then doing the equivalent <coughs> on the other side. And on this side, we would add seven when I'm not making you sit there while I move seven things over there and seven things over here. Okay. If we added seven things to this side, they would just go away. Right. They would cancel out these negative things. Well, if I could, I, I would put two more on there, we would have 12, and then we would uh, reduce this by 1 sixth, and take 1 sixth of this, and we get x is 2. Okay, so not, not moving things from one side to the other, but canceling them on one side. All right, so we've got this down. We can manipulate equations that have variables on both sides. What are we going to do with this equation? Around now, number 36. Multiply in the parentheses. Distribute it. Okay. Here's the thing you need to be really careful of, and you may not do it now, and maybe you'll never do it, but maybe somebody else would do this. Subtracting an n on both sides. Okay. This, this happens quite a bit, especially when distributing isn't your main focus, or you don't feel like distributing, you feel like it would be worse. Um, and you just want to subtract the n right out of the parentheses, just suck it right out of there. Suck this one out of there. But those aren't worth the same thing, are they? This is worth negative four times that. This is worth three times that. You have to distribute before you can start manipulating those things. That's not the case. So we'll distribute negative four n minus eight, three n minus 12. And we just have, it's the same thing as 26, don't we? Variables on both sides. So what shall we do? Minus 3n. Minus 3n, okay. I like it, it's a good idea. Can we do something at the same time? Save a little space at both sides? Yeah, plus 8. Add 8 to both sides. Subtracting 3n cancels out that 3n. Uh, adding 8 cancels out that negative 8. So now we get negative 7n equals negative uh, 4. And now what do we need to cancel out that negative 7? 7, 7n seven is equal to a positive 4 sevenths. You know what's going to make me really sad on these answers and these quizzes if I see it? Uh, no, not, not, not something that's you know completely way out there. A decimal. A decimal, yeah. Let's see, a decimal, it's a fraction. Unless the answer is in dollars or cents or 
uh, gallons some unit, just leave it as a fraction. Okay. We don't usually say four sevenths of the gallon, uh, but we do say four sevenths as a number, and that could be just fine for the answer. For the context, that makes the most sense. All right. What's our first move here? Got lots of choices. What's your choice? What do you do? Daniel? I put all the fractions in the 60 degrees. So you found a common denominator of all the fractions. And luckily, we only have sevenths and ninths involved. And so we're going to just find a common denominator for all of them. OK. Um, let me ask you a question. Would you do that if, I, if instead we had that? And instead, maybe we had this. Would you do it then? Would you find a common denominator then? Why not? Because we already have the same denominator. The like terms already have common denominators. So no, we wouldn't have any need for that. Um, so we wouldn't do that. So we went ahead and get, do 60 thirds, because you know we're going to have a common denominator here and here, and that's going to turn out to be the same thing. So what are we going to multiply 7 by? 4. Mm -hmm. Multiply 3 by 9. 27 over 63 W minus, what are we going to multiply 9 by? 7. 9 by, multiply 7. 14 over 63 equals, we're going to multiply 9 by. 7, of course, we just did that. 28 over 9 W, multiply 7 by 9. We said that already. So plus 9 over 63, and I should have written 63. <coughs> yeah, am I right? Am I wrong? Really fast. I'm not good at this stuff. Too fast. Now what? Now we have common denominators. My like terms. My like terms. Okay. How are we gonna do that? Because they're on opposite sides of the equation. Okay. Subtract 20, 27 W from both sides. Do we do something else at the same time? Be efficient. Minus nine sixty. Nice. Minus nine sixty-three. Okay, that cancels. And then this cancels. And this side is negative twenty-three sixty-thirds. This side is one sixty-third W. All we want to do is get W by itself. We want to isolate W, we get one times W. How do we get one times W? Cancel, multiply this by 63 over 1. That's nice. That's convenient. Yeah. Negative 23. That's delta. Any questions there? Get it too fast? Too slow? Too exactly the right speed? That's too much of that? No? Okay. No questions there. Any questions from the homework? General at large. Okay, then let's turn in those homeworks. That'll be fun. Make sure you got your name and your ID at the top left. Some kind of an identification of what the homework is. Staple if you have it. There's four here. We have four homeworks here. In the front row. Are we missing somebody? What do I need from you? A pink slip. Now we're waiting on you. Let's go.
we throw out a pink slip if we're gonna like use our mm -hmm. homework cups? Yeah, that's exactly it. Right. You don't have your homework? Right. But then when you turn it in, I get it. Okay. Today, we probably make it as far as this right here. We're going to talk about relations and functions. What makes a relation a function? What's special about a relation that makes it a function? Uh, we're going to talk about how to identify a function in a few different ways. One specific way on a graph is a vertical line test. Um, you're talking about words like input and output. These are really important words. Okay, so. If you want to do yourself a favor, you'll make sure to make a special note about inputs and outputs and just ooh, be really good friends, good words. And when I say them, then you, you know, raise up a feeling inside you, a good one, one where you know what you're talking about. Okay? So, what's a relation? That's what we're going to talk about. All right, here, right here, this could represent a relation. A relation uh, takes things from over here, okay, in this big blue area, uh, called the domain. All these things in the domain uh, are inputs, okay? They're about to be put into the relation, okay? What do relations do? They relate things, okay? They're gonna relate these things to other things, other things are gonna come out, okay? If these are inputs, what comes out? Output. Outputs, okay? And then we have all the outputs over here, we can look at them and, and say what they are. All of them together will be the range, okay? We'll do more on that in a bit. But first, I'll show you this thing that I worked on, okay? So a relation just takes an input, and turns it into an output. Is your mind blown? I'm gonna blow your mind. Wow. Do that. Yeah, that's right. How to do that? Okay, so I'm gonna make you watch as I do this 12 times. Did you draw that? Draw this little relation? Yeah, I drew that. So you practically built it. Oh, I built it. It's <laughs> mystery. <laughs> wow. How are we going? Do you? Hey, now. Oh, I see. Oh, you forgot one. You too. What did you do? Cool. Okay. <laughs> How does it do that? Okay. Uh, here we go. <coughs> I'm gonna copy these. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, you missed seven. What I do? Not in the same Vegas. All right. So the relation, this is the relation. It's the thing that communicates the inputs into outputs. Um, takes each of these things, and I've lined them up nicely so the thing on the top lines up with the thing on the top. The input on the top lines up with the output on the top. Okay. So what are all those things called? The range. They're what? Domain. Each of them. Each of them by themselves. This thing is called? Input. And input, this one's called an input. Altogether, they're called no. the domain. Okay. This one's called output. And this one's called output. And this one. Output. And altogether, the range. range. Okay. And domain and range. All right. So we're starting to get a nice little idea of what inputs and outputs are. Um, 
Now, a relation is not a really specific thing. It, it, can, it can do whatever it wants. It can relate things to other things, inputs to outputs, in whatever fashion it wants. It could make sense or it could not make sense. Okay. Eventually, we'll get to, to special relations called functions and functions that do make sense. There's a rule for them. Right now, the rule to us is not clear. Okay. And a relation can do that. You can just take, you can take a random house uh, pet and map it to a piece of farm equipment. There's no reason why a cat should be mapped to a tractor and a dog should be mapped to a rake. You know? It's just, but you can do that. That's a relation. It makes no sense, but it relates one thing to another. Um, so any guesses what this relation might be if it, if it did make sense? Why would 1 relate to 1.2? So on down the line, it seems to be like 1.8. These uh, numbers are kind of big there in the middle. What if, what if these were months? Okay, what month would this be? January. And this one? September. Oh, that was fast, and you were right. September. Uh, okay, if I told you those were months, could you make a guess at what these are? What? Dates. 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 Month and then day. So January 1.2. Uh, okay, that's a guess. It's not. That's not what it is. But that is a guess. Uh, well. Precipitation be measured, measured in inches. So in January, we'll see about 1.2 inches in. This is in Missoula. Average rainfall in the month of uh, the month of January. Uh, the month of February, about 0.8 inches. Getting a little more rain uh, here. In what what month is this related to? May. May, June. We get a lot of rain in May and June. Yeah. We do. Okay, and then it's. At July, we might get some more, uh, and then it's not very much. Then we get into what October, not a lot. Um, and I believe this is rain or snow or sleet or any kind of precipitation. Anyway, there's an example of relation. It takes one thing and it relates it to another. Okay. Um, and move these over a little bit. Move these over a little bit. Because we can represent relations in uh, lots of different ways. Okay. Um, one way is what this looks most like. Yeah, there we are. Uh, it's called a mapping diagram. So I can draw the domain and the range. I can I can write them out, and then I can just draw an arrow from each input to its output. Have I missed any yet? I missed one last last class. Take that as a no. Nobody talking. No. Okay. All right, so we just drew, drew an arrow from every input to every output. There's a mapping diagram. And mapping diagrams don't have to be straight across. I can move this guy down here, move this guy up there, this one down there, that can be over there, down here, this one up there. It can be whatever. And as messy as it looks, still the arrow points to the input from, from one input to its output. So there's a mapping diagram. Well, let's make a little bit of room for another representation of a relation. It's where I actually got all this information I got it from this table. Okay, so a table is another way to represent a relation. How small can we make it? Uh, we can make that small. Okay, 
So this table told me what the inputs versus outputs were. The month of January was 1.2, so I made a 1, and then I made it map to a 1.2 right there. And on down the line. So there's a table, there's another way to represent it. Table could look like that, it could look like this, right? We make tables a lot like that, where we have an X and a Y, that could be a table, just right next to each other. So no arrows there, just right next to each other. Um, and the way any relation works, we go to an input, we, we start by at an, at an input, and then we go to its output. So we go over to the input, June, how much did it rain in June? And it rained 1.8, okay? Um, yeah. uh, so, back to that again, table. We could also take uh, each of these pairs and just pair them up in what's called an ordered pair. The order being input, output. Input of two, output of 0.8. Input of three, output of 1.0. And we can continue on, we can use ordered pairs. How many ways is that? How many ways can we represent a, a relation so far? Three. Three? We got mapping diagram, table, ordered pairs. This, copy it, copy it over. And here is, well, it's not the only way that's left, but it's the only way that's left that we care about. Um, and that's a graph. Graphs are gonna be really popular with us. Um, and we'll just do this. So there's, we could write one, or we could write January. We don't have to write numbers. It doesn't always have to be numbers. We could write uh, January, February, March, or you could do numbers. And we can see that the range, right, the outputs, well, they're all between zero and two. So when you graph things, we take that into consideration. January 1.2, February 0.8, April right at 1. We can go all the way down to all 12 months and graph those inputs and outputs as points on a graph. Okay, so there's four ways. Here we go. This is in your book. This guy right here. Four different ways to represent a relation. This one, before we talk about it, this one is supposed to look like this, supposed to be a negative two. Right, so that's four different ways right there in that little box to represent the same relation. So let's talk about this relation. What's the domain of this relation? You can look at any one of these and figure out what the domain is. The domain is all the x's. So, and we just lay. We say what they are. We just list them out. And you don't even have to write negative two twice. You can just write it once. Okay. That's just a list of all the numbers in the domain. Is that a question or a stretch? Yeah. That would be a good one. Good stretch. Uh, You know, you, you're woken up in the morning, you ever do that? And then you stretch. You stretch so much that like you can't stop stretching. Mm -hmm. And then somebody comes along this jerky and has to like fake a punch in the stomach or something. It just ruins it. It's the worst. <laughs> so that stretch where you stretch and you just can't stop stretching, has a name. You know what the name of that kind of stretch is? Not a little one, not like, ah, like that, but just, you just keep stretching. It's called the racks. Sounds like a monster. I wonder what it looks like. <laughs> I think it's a nice looking monster. Because uh, it helps you stretch. It feels so good. Stretch. Um, so, now we're back to math. About the range. What's the range of this relation? 2, uh, two negative 2, 1, 1. 2, negative 2. And we don't have to say 1 twice. We can say it once. We can even do 1. 
Uh, negative two, two. Right? They don't even have to match up when you write them as a domain and range. They're just set of numbers, set of numbers. Okay. These squiggly brackets, if you're going to write a set of things, and you know what a set is, right? You have a set of cards or a set of, of collectible items or whatever, a set of, of plates and bowls. It's just a grouping of things that have something in common. And if you're going to list out a set of numbers, you use these squiggly brackets. So this, this would stand for the set of negative 2, 0, 3 ends a set. That's the end of the set. <coughs> OK. So how do you feel about that? If I showed you some stuff like this, then you can find the domain and the range. Uh, here, let's try this. Let's give it some practice. Um, number six. Number six. So get out your notes, as you already have out. I don't have to tell you to take it from because they're already out. Of course, you have your notes out. Right away. Number six in 2.1. 2.1. Uh, Six and 2.1, they want a few things. They want the domain and the range, so write those down. They also want you to re represent this relation differently. They want you to represent it as a graph and as a mapping diagram. Go to work. <coughs>
Okay, so we're going to write the domain. We can use the shorthand D for domain. Colon. Domain is the set of these numbers that I'm about to write down. What set of numbers makes up the domain? All of the x's, you actually list them out. You say them. You say what the numbers are. So, so which numbers are they? Three. There they are. There is the domain. It is all the numbers that are inputs. <coughs> Next, what is the range? All the y's. Four, negative five, negative two, and six. How do I make a mapping diagram? <laughs> put input and the output on and then we do like a table. Like a table? Yeah. Okay. So for this part's sort of important. The just like table. Input. Huh? That's like what? No, no, no. No. So, okay, so now what? Um put uh like two, one, uh, negative three, and seven, negative seven. Okay. And then uh, negative five, uh, negative two, uh, six, four. Okay. No particular order, right? Or maybe. Don't. No. 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 No order is important when you're doing a mapping diagram. Not important. Okay. Okay. So now what do I do? Negative seven goes to four. One goes to one goes to negative two. Two goes to negative five. Okay. And negative three to six. Okay, pretty straightforward. All the arrows went straight across. Do the arrows have to go straight across? No. No, they don't have to. Okay. And a graph. So here's graph. We're gonna draw a graph. Uh, what does this axis represent? What, what kinds of things will we find along this axis? X, X, X. X or the yeah. inputs. <coughs> and the inputs will be along this <coughs> axis. And what axis? Y. Is this Y or the output. outputs. Okay? And we don't have to, we, we use X and Y a lot. We don't have to. We can use R and Z or whatever. Uh, but this is definitely inputs and outputs. So we have an input of negative 7. Seven, seven, and an output of four. And we put a dot right there. Two negative five. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. One negative two. There, negative three. And six. There you go. Graph that relation. The input versus output have been represented in three ways uh, altogether. One by order pairs, one by uh, a mapping diagram, one by a graph. What's left? A table. We can do a table. A table would pretty much look like this mapping diagram. Since they are right next to each other, we can just squish them together uh, and make sure that 2 is right next to negative 5. And likewise for the rest of them. All right. So now let's get out of this. Uh, random assignment of one number to another with no reasoning whatsoever. Let's have some reason to it, okay? Uh, like y equals 2x. Now there's a reason for one thing to be related to another. We could make a table here, x, y. And uh, what, what do I put here for x? Two. Two. Why two? Because there's a two there. What's that? No, no, no. Go ahead. Random number. Any number you want. Okay? As long as you can put it in to x. Okay? Three, two. Two works. What else? Seven. Seven. What Four. else? Five. A hundred. Why not? How about a negative number? Negative five. Four. Negative five. Uh, Four. Okay. It doesn't matter. We can choose any input as long as it works. Okay? Are all these inputs going to work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, three will be related to what? Six. <laughs> and two? Four. Yeah. Fourteen. Fourteen. Two hundred. Okay. Hey, look at that. 
we have a bunch of inputs and outputs. Are, that, are those all the inputs and outputs? No. How many are there? An infinite number. You cannot count all of the inputs and outputs. OK. Um, so part of what we do in math is to, to find some way to talk about all the possibilities. And one way is the basics. We'll talk about the domain and the range. And we'll do a few of those. Uh, the domain. Okay, let's go way back to our definition of the domain, back to this first slide that we looked at. We defined the domain, right? Uh, the domain's over there, the range is over here. What's, this, what's the meaning of the domain? What's the definition of the domain? Inputs. All of the inputs. So however you can represent all of the inputs, whether it be a list of specific numbers or a description of a kind of a number or kinds of numbers, uh, that's what it'll take. So let's go to here, we'll talk about the domain. And if we're talking about the set of all inputs, where do inputs go? Yeah. Into x. All right, so what's the domain of this function? It might be a bit of a stretch. I, I haven't really been specific, so you're going to have to like create this. Anything in the x, but also we talked about how there's more, right? I could keep listing them forever, and I, that'd be my job for the rest of my life until I die, and I could hand it down to my children. We change our last name into the x-lister, and that would be our profession. You know your last name, a lot of your last name is derived from the, the job that your ancestors had at some point. My, my, middle, my middle name, Duchesne, it's actually a, uh, a um, hair product. It's a hair product yeah. from long, long ago? Yeah, because my, uh, uh, my, all my grandmas and stuff like that, they were all uh, like uh, hair people. Oh, so this is kind of recently? A couple, uh, been a couple, no, a couple grandmas ago. Yeah. Generations? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that'll happen a lot. Like uh, Thatcher is the last name that, what does a Thatcher do? Thatches. Baskets. Thatches. Baskets or, or something like that. Or Weaver or uh, Smith or yeah, lots of A Christopherson. <laughs> They're not all, not all that bad. But a lot of times that's what happens. Anyway, we would be the we would be the X listers for the rest of our generations because we could never stop, right? So we can't just list them all. We have to describe them all. All real numbers. All real numbers. Yes, all real numbers. Uh, first of all, I'll show you how to write all real numbers like that. Okay. I'll say it many times. Mathematicians like shorthand. They like using as little ink as possible. So where they got tired of writing all real numbers all the time, they said, this is very tiring. They got very sleepy. So before they took a nap, they made up this letter, R with two vertical lines, and that represents all real numbers. So that's a piece of knowledge for you today. All right, uh, the rational numbers are represented by a Q like that. Why, I don't know, Q? Weird, maybe quotient, right? Fractions, quotient. Uh, you got the, uh, the integers, of course, you use a Z for that. Get your natural numbers. I think it's like that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, just different letters with double bars representing sets of numbers. All real numbers. Let's make sure that's true. What are we saying? What are we saying about like you can take any number and do what to it? Multiply by two. Can you multiply any number by two? Are you serious? Is there any number that you can't multiply by two? That's quite a thing. Sounds like a great product. Multiplication by two. Works on any number. If you want to buy it. OK. How about the range? What numbers can you get out of this function? What numbers can come out as y? All of them? Can you get positive ones? Can you get uh, negative ones? Okay. Can you 
you had fractions. You want the number one? Can you get the number one? Oh. Well, I guess that's the only thing. Multiply by what? Half. Half. Multiply by half. I like half. Half. It's good. Multiply by half. Yeah, you can do anything here. Can you get zero? If you use zero, multiply by zero, you get zero. Okay. You've convinced me there's all the numbers possible can be gotten out of this relation. Call it a relation for now. This actually is a function, but you don't know what that is yet. So we'll leave that for later. All right, so there is a relation. We have the, the domain and the range. And now let's look at something uh, that's a little different. How about y equals 1? Uh, we'll do even 2. Use 2 again. 2 over x. Think about the domain now. Okay, instead of asking yourself, what's the domain? What could you ask yourself so that you actually more well define what the domain is? Yeah. Well, tell me what the domain is, but I'm, ask, I'm asking for the question you could ask yourself. Instead of saying, just what's the domain, which is just kind of a nebulous term until you define it. What's that? Half the range? Half the range? Yeah. Mm, it's not necessarily half the range. What, how do we define the domain? Not just an input, but all the inputs. Where do inputs go? In here, where do inputs go? They go into, where do they go? In here? They go in Y? You put inputs in, into X. X is typically where you put inputs. Okay? And the side that has like some math to do or some arithmetic is typically the side you put input on. Um, so it's going in for x. So we're, we're whittling this down. Domain is set of all the inputs. Inputs go in for x. What's x doing in this relation? It is dividing. It's dividing 2. OK. So to ask what the domain is is to ask, what can I divide 2 by? What numbers can I divide 2 by? Uh, all real numbers. All the real numbers? Mm -hmm. 1? Yeah. 2? Yeah. Do we have enough time to go through all of them? No. Nope. OK. How about all the positive ones? Yep. yep. Fractions? Yep. Decimals. Yep. Negative numbers? Yep. Negative decimals? Yep. Negative fractions? Yep. 0? Yep. yep. Wait a minute. No. How about 0? <laughs> Anything but 0. Anything but 0. Can't do 0. All real numbers except, hey, except zero. Put a line through it to represent a zero, not O. Oh. Why can't we divide by zero? Because, because it's nothing. Divide by nothing. Okay, zero is nothing. Can't divide by nothing. What does that mean? Error. Error. A pretty hard question to answer. But. You just can't do it, let's say that at least for right now. And if we have enough time, I'll, I'll show you a nice little video of my trying to figure out, which I think is fun. And you probably won't, but I think it's fun. <laughs> OK? So all real numbers except for 0 can't divide by 0. Let's look at the range. Okay. Okay. So now, it's not so easy as to say now what numbers can I divide into 2 or, or what numbers can I divide 2 by. Now we have to think, what numbers can happen when I divide 2 by a number? Right? So we ask ourselves kind of the same question. Can I get a big number by dividing 2 by another number? Can I get like a million? How would I get a million? 2 divided by 2 million? 2 divided by 2 million? Yeah. 2 divided by 2 million is going to be 1 over a million. That's going to be pretty small. Use fractions. Use fractions. Right? You want to take a number and divide and get a bigger number? Use some fractions. Okay. Well, very small decimal. Small decimal, right? Fraction, small decimal. So, uh, what part is you use a fraction? When I divide by fractions, what do I multiply by? The reciprocal. The reciprocal. So, what number would I have to multiply by to get a million? Right. Now we're, we're multiplying two over one by what? What? Five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. Hey, five hundred thousand. 
over 1. What's the reciprocal of 500,000 over 1? 1 over 500,000. 1 over 500,000. Divide by 1 over 500,000. Yeah, we did it. We got a million. Okay, great. That's good. So, you know, we got a million. Can we get a billion? Sure. How about smaller numbers? Can we get small numbers? Can we get, like, point five or something? Point six. Or point zero 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 one. Can we get that? Conceivably. Can you conceive of the number that exists and you divide two by that and you get point zero 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 one? How about negative? Can we do that on the negative side? Can we get large, large, like large negative numbers, which means like negative a million would be a, a large negative number. A negative number that's far away from zero. Can we do that? Sure. Can we get negative numbers that are tiny, tiny decimals? Okay. How about zero? Zero is always a great question. Can you get zero? What do you divide two by to get zero? Two zero. Two divided by two is one. No, two divided by zero is impossible. Can't divide by zero. In fact, the only thing you can get in the multiplication division realm, uh, the only way you can get zero in that realm, the that, that part of, let's say, that part of PEMDAS, we're going to oversimplify it. Multiplication division, the only way to get zero with multiplication is to multiply by zero. Okay? And if we were to try to do that with division, right, so like, let's say we take two and we multiply by zero. Zero over one, why not? So then we'll just divide by the reciprocal of that so that when we divide, we multiply by the reciprocal, but then we'll have to take two divided by one over zero, which isn't possible, can't do it. So can we get zero by dividing? Two divided by something get zero? Can we get close to zero? Yes. How do we get a number really close to zero by dividing? Two divided by, what gives you a number close to zero? Two divided by two is one, which isn't that far away. Uh, one over three. Two divided by one over three? Yep. Two divided by one over three. You remember that when we divide by a fraction, we multiply by the reciprocal. So that's two times three over one. Two times three. That's six. Uh, um, the the biggest number, number you can think of. Biggest number you can think of. What's the biggest number you can think of? Two divided by four. Seven. That's close. Two divided by four. Forty is big. Okay. Two divided by forty. Pretty small. What? A million? A trillion. A trillion. A trillion. We don't want to write them in zeros. Good Good yeah, you can get close. Close. Major point. Major, majorly close. But you can never reach okay? zero. But you can't ever reach zero. Okay? So what's the range of this function? We just talked about all the numbers that we can get. Everything but zero, all real numbers, except zero. Okay? We're having a good time. <laughs> okay. Let's take this function. Y equals x squared. You think about it on your own. Now you've got two of these, you know, in your experience. Think about it for, let's say, a minute. And then we'll get together and see what we think. Put in with the, uh, write it down if you uh, if it helps. I think it helps.
Okay, Chauncey, what do you say? So domain's all real numbers, and then the range is all real numbers except for zero. I think so. Okay. So let's look at domain first. So domain, I think it's it's kind of easier than the range. Um, I was gonna say kind of easy. It's easier than the range, I think. Um, the domain is a set of all what? Okay. Where do inputs go? Actually, into the x. What are you doing to the number that you put in for x? Squaring, you're multiplying it by itself. What numbers can you multiply by itself? All of them. The two by itself, negatives by itself, fractions by themselves, zero by itself. Multiply zero by zero? You could. Why not? It's kind of silly, but you can do it. So yeah, all real numbers, I agree. Okay? Let's look at uh, the range. When you square a number, you multiply a number by its exact copy. Get any number you want. <coughs> Not negatives, because if I multiply a number by itself, okay, we can split it into two kinds of numbers: positive, positive over here for you, and negative. Multiply a positive by itself, you get positive. Negative by itself, you get positive. Okay. How about zero? Can you multiply zero by itself? What do you get? Zero. You get zero. What numbers can we not get out of this thing? Negative, negative numbers. So what numbers? Do we get out of this? Positive. Positives. Positive. Here's how to say positives. All the positive real numbers. And? Zero. And zero. Got to say and zero because zero is its own number. It's not positive. It's not negative. It's just zero. Yeah? Why do you put the slash for this Just so it doesn't look like an O. Except O. Okay. So all real numbers and zero. All, all positive real numbers. Questions? The answers? Okay, standard teacher humor. Okay. Let's look at uh, one more function, or what, one more, sorry, I keep saying function. We're about to get into function. One more relation. Actually, almost everything we looked at, looked at is a function, and I'll show you what, uh, what kind of a thing is not a function. This is not a function. But first, I want you to list the domain and the range. You need about 15 seconds this time. <laughs> Girls' bathroom. Uh, that noise is. It's so normal. Domain, you said, would be all real numbers except zero? Yeah. Domain, we're saying all real numbers except zero. So what you're saying is that you can take the square root of anything, but you can't take the square root of zero. Let's, let's start easy. What's the square root of four? Two. It's two. Why? How come? Two. two times two. Two times itself is four. That's why two is the square root of four. Okay, so what's the square root of zero? Zero, because zero. zero times zero is possible to multiply by itself to get zero. Okay. So zero is okay. Are all real numbers okay? No. 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 What real numbers are not okay? Negatives. Negatives can't take the square root of a negative number. Square root of negative four, impossible. Right? Because we need a number times its exact copy. What's the only way to multiply and get a negative? A negative and a positive. Negative and a positive. You can't have a number that is itself negative and positive. So no. Uh, that's not going to work. So what's the domain look like? All R, numbers and then a positive. Yes, yeah, so all positive real numbers, so I could have just left that. All positive real numbers and zero. That looks familiar. That looks like the range, the range of this guy. No coincidence, because think it's x squared, the square root of x, they're inverses. Right? Mm -hmm. Square a number, find a number that is its its own square root, it is a number times itself. <coughs> anyway, we're on the range now. The range, what kind of numbers can we get out of this function? 
All real numbers. All real numbers? Can you justify that? How do you get a negative number out of this? You're going to have to have a positive and a negative. Well, you can't have negatives because when you have a, a power and stuff, you're taking like two times two. Uh, two uh, so you can't have a negative. Well, you can't take the square root of a negative, but what we're talking about, can you get a, ne a negative out of the square root? Let's see. Square root of 4 means a number times itself that equals 4, right? Which would be negative 2. Ah. So positive 2 works, and negative 2 works. Oh, okay. Right? So now what happens, if I put 16 in here, what comes out? 4, negative 4. Is that different from what we've been looking at? Has that ever happened before? Let's look at these other functions, or these, these other relations we've been looking at. You get two numbers out of that? Square two, what do you get? Four. Square seven, what do you get? 49. You get two things out of there? No, you get 49. You get four. You get one output. Okay. How about this one? Two divided by a number, you're going to get two outputs? A one of two divided by a number is there's only one number that is two divided by that number. Two times a number. Well, just one output. Put in five, you get out ten, there's no other choices. But this one, you take the square root of a number, and there's two possibilities. Could be four, could be negative four. If you put sixteen in there. Okay? So all real numbers is this works, right? All real numbers, you get all real you get zero out of there, you get positives, you can get negatives, and it's all taken care of. Okay, so that's the, that's the domain of the ranges, that's fine. So this is an example of something that is not a function, not a function. These all are functions, okay? What's the difference between, we just talked about, what's the difference between these guys here and this one here? So you get two, uh, two, you get two outputs, Yeah. Output. right? How many outputs do you get out of this guy? One. One. You put in a number, you get out one number. Uh, let's look over here. Uh, function? Yeah. yeah. Put in a number, how many do you get out? One. 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 Uh, function or not a function? Function. Function. How about, let's look right here. Look at the mapping diagram. Negative two, output, second output. Not a function. Not a function. Okay, how about this guy right here? Function or not a function? Function. It's a function. You go to a month, you get? One number. One output, one uh, measure of rainfall for that month. Okay, so not a function, that's not a function. And uh, this function or not a function? Function, one output only for each input. Function, not a function. So a function that's a relation. It's a special kind of relation. What does a relation do? It what? It pairs two things. It takes this, turns it into that. It takes this, relates it to that. Okay? Relation um, for which Every input, every input, what? Finish that sentence. Has one output? Is that specific enough? Outputs. As, how many outputs can it have if it's going to be a function? One. 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 Let's go back. I want you to think really carefully. Think really mathematicianally about this. When I put 16 in here, does it have one output? No. Does it have one? It has one, but it only has one. It has one. It also it has, has two. One, but a function so only has one. Only has one. Okay. So every input has at least one. At least only one. one. Only one. Only one. Only one. And that only not only does it not mean two or three or four or whatever, not more than one, it also means not less than one. Can't have zero output. You gotta have an output. So every input has only one output. Only way it's gonna work. Only one. All right. 
So uh, let's real quickly, before we go on to the next thing, look at Numbers 10 through 13. 10 through 13. And I'm hoping to trick somebody today. I always trick somebody, every class, every year. OK, here we go. 10 through 13, I want you to tell me in any of those, is there any of those that is not a function? 12. Why is it could be specific about you know an example of why it's not a function? Negative one has two outputs. You're done. Negative negative one has two outputs. That's enough. Also negative or not negative five has two outputs. So uh, I guess it's extra not a function. <coughs> Any others? Say again. And eleven, negative three, and two. I gotcha. Okay, I tricked you. Oh. All right. And thirteen, maybe you would think it's not a function. It is a function because keep in mind what the definition says. It doesn't say anything about the other way around. It doesn't say anything about outputs back to inputs. It says every input goes where? To one output, only one. But outputs, even if you had two outputs go to the same, two inputs go to the same output, I wouldn't violate this rule. This, if we look at, well, even at 13, okay? How many outputs does negative eight have? One. one. How many outputs does negative four have? One. They all have just one output. They're all the same output, but that's okay. Okay. All right. So, um, let's go back here. We started with y equals two x. And we started to list inputs and outputs. And then we said, well, we, we would never get done with that, right? I could pick X's for the rest of my life, and my, my whole family tree could become a, a family of X listers because there's no end to it. Part of, of math is to be able to talk about all of it, the whole thing, not just specific examples. Something we like to do is talk about the whole thing. So one way to at least get close to representing all of it is to draw a graph. Because a graph, if we show all the points, we'll start to get a shape out of it, and that shape will represent all the input-output pairs. Okay? So for a number like, hmm, there we go, uh, 27, y equals 3x plus 1. Okay. Could do the same thing for 27 that we did Back here for this example, we could list inputs versus their outputs, and, and we would have some examples. But they would be discrete, meaning specific examples. And you know, what about, what about all those x's between 2 and 3? There's 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, and all those, and then in between 2 and 2.1, and, and on down the line. Okay, don't pack up quite yet. We've got a couple more minutes. Where's your time at though? Okay. So one way is a graph. I'm gonna, I have to go. You have to go every day. Every day. Yeah, every day. Okay, goodbye. So we draw a graph. The graph represents all of the inputs and outputs. And if we could get an idea of what the graph looks like, we could just like generalize it and draw this shape out. You know what this is gonna be when we graph it? What shape it's gonna take? Not a triangle. A square. Okay, let's, let's, a let's line. start a line. a line. Let's start, and even if you didn't know it was going to be a line, it'll become uh, at least pretty convincing that it would be a line. Okay? How will we start? How can we start to graph it? Um, domains, inputs. What's that? Yeah, uh, domains, inputs, and stuff like that. Uh, well, that'll give us some information, but it won't really translate to what the graph looks like. Well, what do you start positive one on the Okay, so we can just find some inputs and outputs, right? We can just go to one, there's one, and what will the output be for one? Negative four. You put in one there, three times one is three, plus one is four. There, we put a point right there, okay? So what we have here, We'll try to spend some more time on it next time, but a graph is a really important thing. Uh, it's not just a magic picture that appears because you see this and you just know the connection. It 
represents all the input-output pairs. Here's one of them, one comma four. That means if you put in one, you get out four, input-output. Told you that was an important word. How about if we go to two? What's the output at two? Um. Seven, three, four, five, six, seven. That's uh, what you got there. Okay, as best I can do. How about zero? We'll come back the other way. One, zero, one, negative one. Two. About negative two. Right. Three times negative one is negative three. One minus three is negative two. So well, what's that? So uh, at whatever number you're choosing, like one, two, and stuff like that, you're putting it in where x is. Yes. And then doing everything else. Yes. Okay. And you can see the pattern is emerging. Like every time I make x one more, I'm just adding three more. To the like the last number. I start at negative two. If I move over, I go up three. Move over, go up three again. Move over, I go up three. Right? So that pattern. What's that pattern called? Remember for a line? Slope. slope. <laughs> That's the slope of the line. That's right. All equations for lines will look like this. Y equals m x plus b. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Now, it doesn't have to look like that uh, to start with, but you have to be able to rearrange the, the numbers in there to look like this. A number times x, x to the first power only, not squared, not to the third. If you see any other power, it's not what's called a linear function. Okay, so to the first power, which we don't ever write, but uh, just make it specific. That's a linear function. And for any graph that you want to make, plot some points. Plot two, three, four points. Okay. Here's the thing, though. If you can tell before you start that it's going to be a line, what is the most points you have to plot? Two. You only need two. If you, gra if you graph three or four or five, it's just going to be redundant. If you graph enough of them, if you graph a point here and 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 here, and you just keep on going, you'll eventually have drawn a line in a really, really slow way by making a bunch of dots. And that's exactly what this line is. It is just a bunch of dots right next to each other. And every dot possibly imaginable between every two dots. OK? Uh, one last thing that's important that will save you confusion if you pay attention to it. Um, I could say y equals 3x plus 1. I could say for this. Uh, when x equals 2, then y equals what? 4. Uh, four. 7. Wait, 2 times yeah. 3 is 6 plus 1 is 7. When x equals negative 2, then y equals negative 5. This gets old. Mathematicians like to save ink, so here's how they save ink. They came up with function notation. Okay. Rather than writing y equals 3x plus 1, they write f of x equals 3x plus 1. Okay? That's not f times x. f of x is read, read f of x, and it just means y. It's just the output. Okay? Now here's the advantage. Instead of writing when x equals 2, then y equals 7, you just say f of 2 is 7. I replace x with 2 in the function called f, and what I get is 7. Okay? Over here, what would I write well, to represent this whole sentence? f uh, parentheses negative 2 equals negative 5. That's it. A lot faster, concise. And not only that, if g of x equals negative 2x minus 6, now I can ask a question about either function I want with whatever input I want really quickly. So what if I said g of 2? What's g of 2? What? What am I going to do with this 2? Plug it in. Where? Where? On the g. You put it right there. So what do you get? Negative 10. Negative 10. 
What's f of 1? f of 1. What's f of 1? Yep, that's why we use function notation to get names for your functions. So if I say f, I know f, it's 4. Okay. If I say g of 3, you know you're going to put 3 in for x in the function called g, not f. And we can have lots of functions, f, and g, q, r, s, m, h, whatever. You can have lots of different functions, all with different names, instead of all having y, and that's what function notation is.